Welcome to Founderline, the show where we answer your questions about startups. I'm your host, Joe Beninato. Thanks for joining us today. It's great to have you all with us. Founderline's all about helping people who are involved with startups. So maybe you're thinking about starting a company and you have a, a question on your mind, or maybe you're right in the middle of, of a company that you launched a while ago and you have some issues you're dealing with. Maybe you're an employee who's thinking about joining a startup and you want to ask some questions before you decide to accept an offer. In any of those cases, we'd love to try and help you out if we can. Um, this is a live show, which means we're available right now to take your questions and see if we can help you. And uh, the best ways to reach us are via email. The email address is help at founderline.com. And you can also tweet to us. Uh, our Twitter handle is at founderline. With that, let's get started. Our guest today is Philip Rosedale, who's a pioneer in the field of virtual reality. Uh, Philip was the founder of both Second Life and now High Fidelity. Uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Good to be here. Great to have you. Uh, thanks for taking the time. I know how busy you are. So um, usually, before we take questions from the audience, I ask you a few just to get you warmed up a little bit and uh -huh. uh, talk a little bit about your background. Um, so you spent a ton of time uh, in this space of the virtual reality space. First, you know, with Linden Lab and Second Life, um, and uh, you know, spent what over ten years, you know, working on that okay. there. Um, take us back, like, to the time when you first got started on that, and what what started you down that path? What was what was the the driving force sure. behind that? Well, I started the company actually in the very end of '99, so it was exciting time. I uh, Exciting time in San Francisco, and dot com we boom, right? started up right in the middle of the uh, very end of the first dot com, big dot com boom. But you know, the idea of building a virtual world was something that, like, I'd been into since I was in college. Uh, I'd always been super passionate about it, but I hadn't thought that the technology was adequate to maybe actually make a, a business and a success out of virtual worlds. So I kind of waited, uh, you know, sort of discovered the internet in about 1994 when I first came to San Francisco super passionate about like moving stuff across the internet so I worked on video and audio and I ended up working at Real Networks actually selling That's my right. little company to Real Networks and was there for a few years and then when the graphics cards came out basically which is what happened in re re really right in 99 I left Real Networks everybody knew what I was doing I was going to do this crazy online you know world build a matrix kind of thing and went back to San Francisco and got started on it and uh, you know, uh, the rest is history. But yeah, it was probably still early. But uh, just always, I wanted to be working on that. And and in those days, the technology, like what, what were we talking about back then? What was state of the art like for processors or speeds? Like, it, I mean, we yeah. were we were still in the dark ages back then, right? Yeah, there were really two things that had happened. One was that broadband access was clearly the way things were going to go. That's Not right. everybody had it yet. It was still like about eight or nine percent of people had it. But if you kind of read the tea leaves, you knew that it was going to go all the way in, a, in another few years, especially in cities. So we had this ability to use like hundreds of kilobits per second of data, which at the time seemed like a lot. And then the other thing was we had fast desktop PCs that had these graphics cards in them so they could do video games, and they could do triangles, 3D graphics really fast. So for me as an entrepreneur, those were the two things. I said if we got broadband and we got a lot of graphics capability, we should be able to build a virtual world that people can get in. It's, it's kind of amazing to think that like you had to worry about broadband back then, right? Like now, Incredible. now we have that like coming through the air to our phones, right? And our, so 50 times our, our system today that we're building is designed to operate at 50 times the speed that Second Life was, and that seemed fast at the time. Unbelievable! That's awesome. Well, and and I'm sure you know as you were building Linden Lab, you probably had some successes and some failures, and learned a ton as as you were going through that. Um, can you talk maybe about some of the the lessons learned that you're now applying as you go through and do high fidelity? Gosh, yeah, so many. I mean, um, uh, well, I was, you know, we were super ambitious. I, I, I'm probably like any, like any entrepreneur or inventor. I was, I, was, I was trying to do, you know, too much too quickly. I, I think that's maybe always true in a way. Like you don't want to engineer that entirely out of your process. Um, uh, we, I, I would say that trying to predict the future when you're working on something that's really uncertain from a how it's going to be used perspective is hard to do like I think we did upfront planning that we didn't really need to do in retrospect because there was so little bearing on what that actually meant so trying to like 
when you're building something completely new that's a new user experience people are going to have, having you know, a three-year plan that estimates how many customers you're going to have in three years, it's just dumb. I mean, that's just wasted time. And it, it's a waste of time to be talking to your board about that and you know, be talking to your investors about it. So mm. I think that would be an example of one thing that I learned, which is to really, just really keep questioning your assumptions and don't plan out too far. That's great. Yeah, I w I've always found in startups, um, when early on when investors are asking about forecasts, whether they be right. users or revenue or anything, I mean, it's yeah, just say no. Yeah, I, I think that's the answer. But you, you, know, you always feel guilty, and you always want to have a slide that shows the five-year growth path. And I, yeah. like, I, I just tell people now, like, don't even bother with that stuff. Like, I can make it up. You can make it up. Like, we can all make it up, but. You might end up being right, but it's not because of any foresight. Yeah. It's just because Could that's what more. ended up happening. So I think that's great. Um, so um, the other thing that I think is really interesting about your background is some of the um, things you did with distributed work with, with Coffee and Power and, and right. now still with Worklist, right? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I don't think everyone is aware of what that stuff is. Sure. So maybe walk us through some of the experiments there and, and yeah. what's happened with that. Well, as technology gets better and better, we gain the ability to negotiate uh, work between people more and more easily, you know, because we have so much transparency. I can I can just send an email, which is kind of like a contract or even a text message. You know, literally a, a contract with somebody could be as short as a text message. Hmm. Everybody can see it. It's logged somewhere. So what this means is that the way the ways that we work together and the speed and the agility with which we can work together are changing quite a bit. And I think those are going to change the structure of companies. And so I've been passionate about experimenting in that. And yeah, at Coffee and Power, we played around with. Uh, how could we get people to work together or meet each other as, as say, startup co-founders uh, using cell phones, using using much lighter weight, faster systems than uh, th than the internet or you know uh, a profile page or something like that? We tried to do that, and then with Worklist, what we actually did, uh, which is really remarkable, we built Coffee and Power as a startup using a amazingly broad set of a couple of hundred people that participated around the world in doing very small, well-defined jobs where hmm. we had an open code base and they would just submit their work into that code base. P other people would review it. There was a way that you could just tell us what you wanted to be paid for something. And 99% of the time, that's exactly what we paid you. All kinds of really different ideas about how to work together that e even today, I'm surprised, even today I think people are not thinking about as much as they should because it's going to really change uh, business. And and you're you're using that today That's right. as you go through high fidelity, right? So yep. is is workless like an integral part of how yep. you guys run the company? Yeah, so for example, high fidelity today we're 19 people full time, but there's about another uh, at this point at this early stage uh, probably another, you know, 10 or 15 people that are actively contributing using Worklist to the development we're doing. And what that means is that uh, it's an open source project, but with the work list, it means that we can actually reach out and say to people, hey, if you want to build a plugin for this different piece of interface hardware for VR, um, just do it. Uh, and we'll pay you through this system, you know, in this very fast way. You know, we'll you know pay you with PayPal. That's kind very of thing. cool. I, I think you know we're seeing some of that with the way Uber and sort of this shared economy. Totally. You know, are, the, are those people W two employees or are they contractors? Right? Yeah. They're 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 doing work for the parties involved. But you know, I think I think Workless is sort of uh, along the same lines, right? It's a different way of accounting for that stuff, and yep. uh, I think it's very cool. So. Uh, Awesome. Well, um, why don't we take some questions, see if we can help sure. some people out. Um, Great. Let's, uh, let's dive in here. Remember, you can um, reach us uh, via email, help at founderline.com, and you can also tweet to at founderline, and we'll see if we can help you out. So let's start with um, Michael from San Jose. Uh, he writes, Ray Kurzweil and Andrew Ng are advancing AI with their work at Google Labs and Baidu Research Lab. What advantages do you have in advancing virtual reality in startups as opposed to joining a large company like Google or Baidu? Right. Pretty cool question. That's a great question, and I think about it all the time. And in fact, you know, we try to be, I try to be very open-minded about how we partner with big companies or work with them, you know, when we should be tiny and when we should be, uh, you know, part of or working with somebody else. The, uh, uh, I think there are types of projects where there's a tremendous amount of uh, quiet, you know, innovation and, and crazy design and experimentation that needs to go on, and that I think that happens as well today with a small team, or better e than ever with a small team, than it it can in a larger company. On the other hand, there are these amazing, fast-changing opportunities to 
deploy and test and scale things that that, that like only big companies do. If you're trying to build deep AI and you need to use like 10,000 machines to try to simulate basically a person, well, you need 10,000 machines, and that's the kind of forward investment that a big company can make. Um, in VR, uh, I think there's a little bit on both sides. You know, we're this uh, small team right now, 20 people, uh, doing the fundamental R&D and design on a new virtual world. Uh, but as that starts to, as we start to get the pieces of that put together, I bet we'll look for opportunities to really rapidly scale out like the test environments for example like if we want to put uh, a virtual space on side online the size of a planet you know would we figure out how to partner with a bigger company to help us do that probably got I mean, it got yeah. it all right cool well michael uh thanks for the question um let's move on we have one here from mark and it says do you have any suggestions for the best ways to keep a group of nine investors up to date on what's happening in our company I find it hard to meet with all of them regularly and still want to get their support and guidance. What has worked best for you? Well, one thing we've done in the in our last couple of years with High Fidelity that's been fun is we have these demo dinners where we'll and we'll invite more than just our investors. We'll invite interesting people, you know, like yourself Friends that are company. Yeah, that are in the community, have an interest in the technology, and we'll we'll just have them kind of walk around and look at working versions of what we're building and try it out. Um, that lets us get everybody in the room at one time. It's enjoyable. It's wonderful for our whole team because we can kind of celebrate what we've gotten done. We can use it as a sort of a development milestone. I like things like that. Um, you know, I, I think your your investors exist in a startup to really back you. Uh, so to a large extent in startups, we've got to remember that you shouldn't have to be talking to them too much or, or, or something's wrong or, you know, their thesis about it is wrong or, or you know, you've got the wrong, you know, wrong people around the table. Yeah. So did you did you ever use like did you do monthly updates or um, I, I guess you probably have some regular board meetings as well for sort of the the legal stuff but any other uh, mechanisms you used? Yeah, we have about quarterly board meetings and I think that's right for a company uh, like ours right now. Um, I sometimes send emails if something interesting happens. I, I'll usually send an email on about a quarterly basis talking about progress, Got trying it. not to forecast because I think as you said we were talking about that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but trying to give a good articulation of what's going on and what's what what external to us is happening that they should be thinking about. That's pretty good. I, I once had at a, a pretty big VC firm, I had someone who called me every day. And uh, <laughs> I mean, crazy. I, I, it's crazy, can right? you imagine what that would be like? I mean, it was a living hell. So. I think some VCs should be startup founders uh, and not VCs. I mean, I, I think the, the, the story the, I tell, probably vice versa. It, it's, it's sort of like having a backseat driver except the backseat driver puts his hands over your eyes and then grabs the <laughs> steering wheel and starts turning it, right? Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, I think you do have to find this balance between fiduciary responsibility, keeping people up to date, and, like, not going out of your mind, right? Yeah. So, uh, um, so, anyway, Mark, I, I, hope, um, I hope that helps. Um, let's move on here. We have one from Michelle in San Francisco. Um, You've probably had both great and not so great investors in startups, yes. Uh, without naming names, can you talk about the char characteristics or behaviors of both? So feel free to name names or not name names, but uh, what would have been some, some good investors and well, some not so good ones? I mean, the, the greatest ones for the type of work that I've done are the ones that really get share the same opportunistic vision about something you know oh wow if this works it'll be huge and that would be like Mitch Kapor who for me has been a friend and a long-term long-time investor uh, in 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 the biggest investor in Second Life and, and also one of the investors in High Fidelity um, so I think that that kind of person is the sort of person that just Mitch is the kind of person by example who recognizes the opportunity in a space invests in a great team in it and then is 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 super fun to have in meetings, you know, because he'll get excited and all pumped up and get you excited yet again about what you're doing. Um, you know, on the negative side, I mean, sometimes, as I say, sometimes investors really maybe should be founders, you know, or they're former founders, or maybe they're like frustrated founders and they're not <laughs> able to run a company, and so they're on a board. And I think that that's got a lot of downside, particularly when there's a lot of design risk in what's being done, because you've got to have a team led by like one or two people that are sort of taking on the design risk and you don't want to have a bunch of board members that are like try this try this no I don't like that you know a different color uh, you know getting involved in the design <laughs> and what you're doing the color um, question from board members right yeah. I mean, it's classic I didn't I, w I didn't see that a ton 
with my investors over the years. I think I, I was pretty crazy and excited about what I was doing. So I think that a lot of times appropriately makes your investors kind of go, okay, well, I'm just going to wait and see. Yeah. Uh, it, but I but I think it happens. I mean, I think in, I, I think investors need to give their investments the space they need to grow up yeah. and succeed. Well, I think a lot of times it comes down to trust, right? And mm. when when they're trusting that, hey, this is the guy and he's going to figure it out or nobody's going to figure it out, so let's let him do his thing, right? Yep. Whereas when they start questioning that, you know, that when the trust starts to break down a little bit, that's yep. when they tend to get a little bit more active and uh, in your business, so yep. that makes it uh, makes it tough as a CEO, as you know, right? So, um, all right. Well, um, Michelle, I hope uh, hope that helps you out a little bit. Um, let's go to um, oh, here's one from uh, from Mikey in New York. Mikey is one of our regulars. So, um, awesome. uh, what are some of the differences between starting a company today versus back in the 1990s, aside from lower cost of starting? So we talked a little bit about the you know the compute power and those sorts of things, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of challenge associated. Just th th there was more challenge associated with the actual mechanics and logistics of starting a company. I think, and about you, yeah. Back then, it was really you spent a lot of time on stuff like, well, for example, investment contracts. You know, the the relationship with an investor, the standard sort of uh, purchase of equity in, uh, in in a financing. That stuff, at least here in San Francisco, it's all standardized yeah. now. I mean, we're not even. We're not even paying our lawyers very much for that part of the equation anymore, and that was something that used to be a huge deal. You know, yeah. as you probably remember, fifty thousand for a financing, yeah, right? Totally, and legal and, fees. Yeah, so I think things like that. I think the basic, and then I think you know, like we were talking about before, the basic work tools are so much easier. Tools like GitHub, the big open, the big big source code repository. Yeah. It's so awesome compared to what uh, we had to start with, to what I was using at Real Networks. You know, what I was using as a leader at Second Life. Um, this stuff has completely taken the whole suite of tools that we had to build and argue over and you know maintain it as a development team and it's totally online. What about um, what about recruiting? Um, have you have you seen a difference mm -hmm. in the sort of the ability to recruit? We were talking a little bit before the show about um, the migration of startups up to San Francisco, right? And, yeah. Uh, and just how how different the world is out here in Silicon Valley, but. Um, what, what have you seen in terms of how, how easy or hard it was back then versus now? I mean, is it about the same or, um, you know, anything, anything changed in that time frame? You know, I think recruiting feels to me fairly similar uh, uh, that, that in terms of the difficulty of getting somebody on board and the way you, the, the way you find them. I mean, there's certainly a lot of online venues now where people find out about you. Maybe you get a greater, a little bit of a greater diversity of people kind of coming in the door. Yeah. Rather than feeling like you're sort of down at the Stanford recruiting fair or something, yeah. and you're yeah. going again and again to get. Uh, I'd say that's one thing that's pretty constant. Maybe that's because we're humans, right? And I mean, yeah, the decision process around going and jumping into a new company, yeah, it's about the same. You know, yeah. The, the only decision. only thing I've noticed is um, uh, there are more people who either think they can be or want to be founders, which really kind mm -hmm. of distributes out the or, or dilutes mm -hmm. the. The pool of people. So, um, in a world where anyone can be a founder, um, you know, it's sort of the too many chiefs and not enough Indians um, mantra. Like, like uh, given how many startups there are today, many of which are probably going nowhere, yeah. um, it might be better if some of those people were actually part of, you know, your company or or a larger company, right? That 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 we're well, sort of true, yeah. going somewhere. Um, so that, that's like one of the bigger things that I think has happened. But uh, Well, there's a trend where we're moving towards smaller firms, which is interesting. We're yeah. moving towards smaller firms and we're moving toward more autonomy within firms. And so I think there's an overshot we're doing where, yeah, everybody is taking on more autonomy than they ultimately might want. Uh, or yeah. you, you've got the situation like, you know, should a, should a 10 person team just, should all 10 people constantly fight over the direction of the company? It's like, no, what you want to do is elect somebody for a term of, you know, maybe it needs to be really short, like a quarter, you know, <laughs> Joe's going to be our, our, our CEO for this quarter and then we'll, we'll vote him in or out wow. at the end of the next quarter. But, but, but I mean, I think the problem is, as you say, that we have so much autonomy and so many tools and people can so easily start their own company that, yeah, it probably does lend, lead to a little bit too much, uh, yeah, everybody wants to run everything. I think that's a good trend overall, but I think that we'll overshoot the mark and then we'll probably 
come back to it in the next you know decade or yeah, something. Yeah, I mean, remember, you know, like our our grandparents and our parents would look at like one company for their whole yeah, lives, right? No, and, and ask uh, no questions. Right? Yeah, and, and it's it's uh, I I I have a lot of respect for people who did that, like day in and day out. They got up, they punched the clock, or they you know went to the factory, or in my case, you know, my dad went to a restaurant every day, right? And I'm sure there were days where he didn't want to be doing that, but that's what paid the bills, yep. right? So, uh, uh, yeah, it's it's a little bit different. So, um, anyway, all right, Mikey, um, uh, there it, there are some thoughts about uh, the differences between now and then. Let's um, let's go to Paul, who has a question about um, Second Life and high fidelity. What are the differences between Second Life and high fidelity? When or why did you decide to do another virtual reality startup? Well. Um, Second Life and High Fidelity are pretty different. There, there's, some, there's a couple of really uh, interesting things we're trying with High Fidelity. They're pretty different than Second Life. For example, we're building an architecture where everybody runs their own piece of the server infrastructure, and then they all kind of connect together to, to help each other create and serve larger and larger virtual spaces. That's a really different idea, pretty out there, pretty aggressive. I wanted to do it. Um, I wanted to do it all over again with a small team. You know, the technology has changed so much that I think uh, taking the risk of starting over with a small team and rewriting everything is something that makes sense in this case. Mm. You know, Linden Lab, and I, 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 I love Linden. It's, you know, Second Life is still, you know, very much my, my baby as well. Um, uh, Second Life's doing great. Linden Lab is actually building another version of Second Life that's, that's going to come out soon. Um, and I think it's going to be great too. Uh, but there's there's so many gosh there, there's so many things changing in the technology around the market right now that I personally thought for me it'd be better I guess kind of better for us all. Linden is actually one of the investors in High Fidelity. Better for all of us if I just went out and got a small team and did it all over again. So we're kind of two uh, two aircraft you know flying in formation now. It's pretty fun. <laughs> oh, it's pretty cool. Um, and and uh, you know the. When when you say they're different, um, can you do the same sorts of things in them? Like for someone who hasn't seen either of them, right. like I, I know, I think I read about like facial tracking, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think you're probably doing more of that now. Yeah. So this experience. So we're tr one of the things we're trying to work on with High Fidelity is how do we across the internet have the experience you and I are having right now, which is we're close and we're you know we're a few feet from each other. We can see each other's faces. We can see each other's hands moving. Can't we do that in virtual reality? And if we could do that in virtual reality, isn't that just absolutely epic? I mean, doesn't that mean the end of space itself in a way? Like, don't we, do we then not have to go to business meetings in New York to see somebody face to face? Well, the answer is yeah. And that's that's so that's the technology we're working on. So we we took a serious R and D approach to that. A bunch of other good companies doing the same thing. We're all racing to try to create this face to face experience, and it's going to work. That's cool. We should have done this with our Oculus, uh, you know, headsets on. Uh, Both of them sitting here. Yeah, yeah, just sitting here, <laughs> and they they could patch it in somehow right. uh, across the internet. Um, all right. Uh, well, Paul, I hope uh, hope that answers your question. Um, let's uh, let's go to another one. This, this one is anonymous. Um, you've been able to raise a lot of money from some great investors. What are the key reasons you're able to do that? Any insights for a first-time CEO? So I, I get asked this question all the time about like, uh, uh, well, I'll let you go first, but um, but like, th you know, it's for first time people who um, who have never done it before, and they kind of wonder, you know, how do you how do you pull this off? Or we've raised our seed round now, how do we get the investors for the next round? So uh, yeah. maybe share some secrets of how you uh, how you pull that off in in the various companies. Well, I think those two things, seed round and the next round, are a little bit different, right? Uh, I mean, one thing is obviously prototype and try something and build something to show people. It's not, it's not going to be your, your, your slide deck. If, if it can be something that works the tiniest bit or tests the idea that you have, that's what's going to sell investors. The other thing is just passion. Um, I, you know, I've invested a, a few times, and I, I've certainly, certainly have lots of friends who are great investors. And there's no question but that if somebody demonstrates a genuine unstoppable zeal for trying something out or, or you know by God I'm gonna make this business work or 
or, or nothing. You know, it's, it's all I can think about. That's the kind of person you want to invest in. And I, and I think sometimes people err on the side of trying to present themselves as a sort of a wall of perfect research and you know, cool and calm, and I know everything about this field, and I'm like an analyst or something. But those aren't the people to invest in. The people to invest in are the crazy ones who um, are absolutely can't stop thinking about some particular idea. And so for me, that's been my life. I cannot stop thinking about the place that we're all going to be able to collectively create together inside the computers that's going to be bigger than Earth and bigger than space. And, and that, so that idea just keeps me going. And so I think investors have met me and have said, well, the guy's reasonably smart and, and personable and he's just absolutely nuts about this idea. So why wouldn't we invest in him if we think that the technology is going that way directionally? Well, and, and I think um, when, when we go through these bubble times here in, in the technology world, um, sometimes what happens is the analysts kind of take over, right? And so you get this exodus or, or, or influx of um, lots of people who are thinking about it and worrying about their spreadsheets and their, their uh, PowerPoint decks and whatever, and, the, and they really don't care passionately about the stuff that they're working on, right? Yeah. And, uh, it, it's you know the the greatest thing you can do is work on stuff that's kind of your hobby as well, right? And get paid for it and and turn it into a, a thing that can support a bunch of a bunch of people who are working there and and great customers and uh, and so you know I, I always hear from like professional athletes like they're so lucky that they get to play a game for a love. living, right? Yeah. And I think we get to do some of that as well, right? It's yeah, it, and I, I think you know I would say I think there are businesses out there that are differential. And competitive, where the analyst mindset does win, and and I think if you're a shrewd investor, well, you certainly don't back me in that kind of role, but you do back somebody that's got that thinking. If you're trying to provide better customer service in an in an already busy marketplace, you need to attend to the numbers. I mean, you need to really be detailed and and strong-willed and you know and thoughtful about what you're doing. I just think the thing is that a lot of times, especially here in San Francisco, especially in software, it's these big new ideas that are then being driven, like you say, by somebody that's more of a, uh, yeah, more of a, a sort of a spreadsheet, uh, you know, worker. And, and I think that's not a good, that's not a good fit. Yeah. And, and look, uh, wh whoever this is, I, I don't know who it is, but um, it's, it's really hard to raise money. And, and I think you and I both know um, it's a big responsibility, right? Like when you, when you take, you know, $5 million from an investor, you carry that weight with you, um, you know, 24 hours a day, right? And I'm not saying you're sweating about, oh my God, are we going to get Firm X yeah. their money back? But, but you know, that responsibility, especially if you take it from friends and family or um, or individuals who are friends of yours. Um, you know, I, I I had this rule where I would never take any money from family members because. You know, startups fail all the time, and you can never know if your company's going to make it. And uh, and so, uh, it, it is hard to to find those people. And when you do, you carry a lot of responsibility with you. So I don't know if you felt that felt yeah. that way. You probably feel it right now, right? Absolutely. And uh, it, you know, it doesn't it doesn't lock you into you know like deer in the headlight syndrome, right? You're, you're not like that, but. Um, you want to you want to do well for them, and of course you want to do well for yourself. But uh, but yeah, raising money um, is is really hard. I I really like the first thing you said about the the demo or the uh, you know the prototype. Right, it's right now you can build stuff pretty inexpensively, and so if you can right. maybe for something really complex where it's going to take. You know, Tesla probably couldn't have built a prototype of, right, of their, the Roadster, you know, the Roadster, right? But but um, but for something that's software, that uh, you know maybe is an app or something, mm -hmm. you can at least do screenshots or or mockups right. or you know something. Uh, so I, I think that helps as well. So let's see. Hopefully uh, that helps you out, whoever uh, whoever you are out there. Um, let's do uh, let's do one more before we go to. Uh, thanking our sponsors here for a minute. Um, this one is from Ramon. It says, I have a startup and I want to hire a creative product manager, the first product manager at this small company. What kinds of questions do you ask to see how creative a candidate is? We have five competent engineers and need someone to lead, lead product definition. What recommendations do you have to help me fill this position? So. You know, I, I would take that a step further, and and you know maybe you can talk about that as well as um, just how you decide to hire people. You know, if you're looking for creativity or whatever yeah. it might be. Um, well, inter 
really Inter important. Yeah, interviewing is hard. I mean, I think that it, it's hard and it's largely unsuccessful, which means that the successful companies are those that find the right role, coach people internally, get get them out when they're not the right fit. You know, that what I've always seen is that's the, the success is really around that. I don't think there's any I don't think there's any way to make interviewing great. That said, um, what I try to interview for nowadays and what I think you would, would be interviewing for if you were getting your chief product officer is, uh, and you're looking for creativity, is more these sort of emotional open-ended questions. Like one of the questions, I, boy, I say, this at the, I say this at the risk of having somebody come and interview with me and say, I, now I know which question you were going to ask. <laughs> and I'll say to people in interviews, take me on the journey where you walk into your your home at at you know like coming home from work or whatever tell me what you in your mind's eye see as you go into your house and if you think about that it's a question that tells you a lot about a person's passions and creativity and you know like do they talk about oh i see this art on the wall or it's it's lit in the following way you know or i see my 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 pet or I see my kids, or whatever. You know, you, you, you see where people kind of place their emphasis and value, and I think interviews nowadays should really, it's so easy to evaluate people's skill, like from a software engineering perspective or from a design perspective. It's much more interesting to evaluate, to, to, to spend the precious time in the interview trying to evaluate, uh, you know, camaraderie and, uh, you know, emotional intelligence and, you know, agility, you know, how, how, how well the person can respond to an unusual question like that. I think those are the things that you really want to try to do in the interview and then figure out other ways. There are so many great tools to let people show you that they have competent skills for the particular job that you're hiring them hmm. for. Yeah, I really like that. That's uh, so you you ask that all the time, like when yep. you and lot. I mean, lots. Yeah. So I so I got a few other ones. I'm not gonna. Uh, yeah, don't. I'm not gonna release here. Yeah, but. don't don't. Uh, so so, um, what like what have been some of the crazy answers that you've heard, uh, or or interesting ones, right? Like because when when you said that to me, I was sort of walking through in my mind. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, the kids are out front playing basketball, or walk in and um, you mm -hmm. know some music is playing or mm -hmm. somebody's cooking or you know mm -hmm. some, something like that so what what but that's uh, like music is like you know your you know personal interest in the arts and creativity cooking is usually doing something together with family um, you know kids are, are, are kids and uh, you know that you're you're seeing that and you're noticing it you know maybe you have a good good work-life balance in that sense um, I've, I've gotten great answers around like my place is such a mess <laughs> I don't want to show it to you. And no, but I think that's cool because that one's good too, right? Like sometimes that's sometimes that might be what you want or not what you want. You know, somebody that's my place is a big mess, and that's what even pops into their head perhaps with some anxiety when you ask them that tells you something about their suitability for a job. But uh, but again, that could be a good thing too. You could want somebody who's kind of random and you know uh, it's crazy. I like it. I, I like it. <laughs> um, you know, interviewing is so hard and and. Um, it's always great when you can work with people that you've worked with before because you kind of know the ins and outs. But if you're going to grow a company large enough, you're going at some yeah. point it's not going to be people you know, right? And, and with some of the stuff you guys are doing, these people could be far away, and you just met them because they submitted something <laughs> over work list, yep. right? So, uh, so yeah, that's that's a really hard thing, Ramon. Um, I uh, I wish you luck, but uh, but. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a tough one. Um, hopefully that helps a little bit. So um, we're going to take a minute to thank our sponsors. So sit back and relax for a minute. Take a deep breath. Um, so, uh, you know, we couldn't do this show without the amazing support we get from our sponsors. And uh, for this season, our sponsors are Auric and Square One Bank, uh, Creative Solutions, and Ustream. Um, first, I want to thank Mitch Zookley and the entire team over at Auric. Um, you know, they're, they're one of the best law firms out there, and uh, I've worked with them on multiple companies. Uh, I, I always tell people when you're doing a startup, of course you want to have a lawyer who can do the basic paperwork and your financing documents and your employment contracts and all the, those sorts of things. But the most important thing you want is that you want a great advisor. And this is somebody who's seen every trick in the book uh, when it comes to partnerships or hiring or or financings or whatever else and they can sort of share that knowledge with you especially when you're a first time uh, CEO or founder going through uh, the formation and the building of a company for the first time so um, having someone like that on your team is invaluable 
uh, you know, you, you don't spend a ton of time with them, but the time you do spend with them is, is just really time well spent. So, uh, you know, make sure you get somebody good. Uh, I, as I said, I've worked with Oric a bunch of times, and, uh, and they're the best. So uh, if you want to find out more information, you can go to auric.com and check them out. Um, next, I want to thank our new sponsor for this season, Square One Bank. And I've known uh, Lori lamenti Gardi and Sam Bomick over there for years. And when you think about banking, of course, you know, the first thing that you, you think of is financial security. Uh, investor writes you a check, and you want to put that somewhere safe where um, you know that your money is going to be there when you need it. Uh, and, but when you're choosing a bank, you want to think about some of the things beyond just the, the basic security of your money, because hopefully everyone offers that. Um, things like online banking, uh, so whoever on your team is handling that for you can have easy access, or even um, as a founder, making sure that you get like a company credit card so that you're not stuck uh, charging all this stuff on your personal credit card. And someday, if things don't work out, you end up with you know mountains of credit card debt because you never got around to it. So um, uh, the team over at Square One can help you out with all that sort of stuff. They're great to work with. Um, you can find out more at their website. It is squareonebank.com. It's square and the number one bank.com. Uh, we're also uh, working with Accretive Solutions this season. So um, Accretive Solutions is the leading business outsourcing firm in Silicon Valley. And um, I've worked with uh, Martini Nigano there for years. Um, she was my interim CFO at Tello. And um, uh, you know, a lot of people wonder what business outsourcing is. It's basically your whole finance function, which in the earliest days of your startup, um, you don't need to hire a CFO full-time and a controller full-time and accountants and all that sort of stuff. Um, you want to have somebody who can do that very cost-effectively for you, and um, a Creative Solutions can take care of all that stuff for you. The accounts receivable, if you have them, uh, accounts payable, which is more likely in the early days, and uh, your payroll, um, making sure you have um, uh, financial packages to go out to the board. Um, as a founder or CEO, you shouldn't be worrying about getting that stuff ready you know, every time for the board. You should have somebody who can take care of that so you can focus on building your product and your business and hiring and all the, all the things that you are mission critical for. So um, uh, you know, check them out. You can find out more on their website, which is as-bos.com. Uh, and then finally, I'd like to thank uh, the team over at Ustream. We've been working with Brad Hunstable and the team over there since the very beginning of FounderLine. And uh, they've been great to work with. Their technology to do uh, the streaming of the show, which you're watching us on right now, is the best. And uh, they've been just a pleasure to work with. Whenever we encounter situations where we want to get more data or we need some help with something, um, they're right there to help us out. So if you want to do um, some live streaming, whether it's a, a company event or maybe uh, you, know, you have um, a, a show that you want to put on or whatever it might be, um, you can go and do it on Ustream if you want to. Uh, you can find out more at their website, which is ustream.tv. So that's it. That's paying the bills. Um, let's get back to some more questions. Um, so let's see, what do we got here? Um, this one is from Kyle in San Francisco. Um, hiring is one of the most difficult things for our company right now. Any suggestions on how to find great employees? So this comes up all the time. Right? Hi, I have a startup, you know, I can't find good people, or I need a co-founder, or like whatever it might be. Um, let, let's spend a few minutes on this because it's it's such a, a critical thing for for the life of a startup. So, what uh, what suggestions do you have? Well, one thing is to focus on maybe maybe or initially focus on hiring people that have unique interests or specializations that make there be less of them, so they're more likely to find you and be passionate about what you're doing. So, hmm. if you've got well, if you're doing something like what we're doing with High Fidelity, you'd want to uh, uh, at least at the outset. And when you're smaller, it's harder to hire people. You'd want to bring people in that are really have really unique skills, like 3D rendering, for example, where even though everybody's you know running around getting jobs right now and it's hard to find people, you know, people that are super experts in 3D rendering are so few that you know they look around at their options and maybe find us and say, hey, I want to work on virtual worlds, I want to work on VR, and you know, come and find us. So one thing what I would say is hire 
hire selectively and, and, and early and aggressively for hire first for the positions that are really interesting in terms of how they relate to your own business and then maybe count on those people as you get bigger to kind of help you fill in the ranks with you know friends or contacts or whatever um, I think hiring's hard I mean it's hard it's hard when the economy's up and the economy's up right now so it's it's tough to find people um, uh, you know I think just being genuine and uh, having an open open internal culture is obviously a big Hiring plus right now, no matter what you're working on, so yeah. I think that can help. Yeah. Uh, what What do you guys do to support that? Um, I mean, does everyone in the company know pretty much everything that's going on? Or yeah, uh, we do. We do a couple of things, um, and I'm I'm a big uh, a gr uh, thinker about th that kind of stuff. But I'll tell you one thing: we do that's I think just exceptional, and I think every startup should do it. Um, every quarter, uh, we take a large portion of our stock options uh, that. W our options pool that would have gone into new employee grants and we, we give some of those some of those to new employees but we give we take a big hunk of stock and we basically give everybody in the company the exact same number of credits basically and you have 24 hours to anonymously give away those credits of yours however you like to everybody else in the company not to yourself and not to yourself, <laughs> knowing that everybody else is doing the same thing. Yeah. And so you uh, comple it's completely at your discretion. You can use whatever strategy you like. There's a little bit of some sort of outside auditing that you can do to make sure people aren't like cheating in that process. But I can tell you that psychologically, actually, people don't. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a pretty empowering thing. So th think how cool it is as a team to have not only good internal transparency, which I think is just uh, table stakes today. You got to have that to yeah. be successful as a company. But but to empower people as we do by saying. Here's, here's this huge chunk of the company's stock. Now give it out to everybody else as best you think. Now that process results in obviously a tremendous feeling of, of uh, empowerment. Uh, you know, we, are, we as a whole company are basically doing this, giving out stock to each other. And in addition to that, it identifies people that have done really amazing work that wouldn't have been uh, found in a traditional like management-led, uh, say, bonus program. That's really cool. So just an example of something that's easy to do again t like we said earlier technology makes it really simple and why wouldn't you do it D didn't you have this thing about um, love mm -hmm. uh, at one yep. point like is that is that still yeah, around yeah so we or? had this thing that we gave the funny name when i was at linden lab because we thought it was just such a it was it was such a, a, a contrarian name of the love machine which was basically right. you could in our chat system um, and and we actually use this at high fidelity and it's actually an an online uh, product uh, uh, that we uh, built as well but basically you can send a message. You can say, you know, you know, dot love in our internal Slack system uh, to anybody else in the company anytime you want, and just a single sentence. So we did this before Twitter, but it was that kind of original idea of a one-sentence statement. You know, Joe, uh, great job having me on the show uh, <laughs> tonight. And you send that message, and they get the message in their inbox immediately, which feels great. But everybody else in the company can also see it. At Second Life, we had screens up on the wall where we kind of had a journal of the messages that were coming out. People tend to use that a ton, like once or twice a day. And this creates an incredible collective transparency tool where you can see what's going on. But it's super fun because you're not sending messages to teams or about products. You're sending messages directly to people. And you just do it whenever you notice somebody's done something good. So That's cool. Um, yeah, yeah, and and you said it's now it's an outside product like that's something you can go sign up for and use. Yeah, for your if company? you if you if you look me up about this, the, there's 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 actually uh, a website which is called Send Love, and you can uh, we actually built a commercial version of this that a number of companies actually use, and you're welcome to use it too. It's a uh, all right, we'll make a little money on it. We'll <laughs> we'll check it out. So send send some love, uh, Phillips Way. Um, all right, so Kyle, uh, you know, hope that helps. Um, Hiring is such a such a challenging thing, but um, hopefully we gave you a few uh, few ideas to to help you out there. Um, let's go to Tommy, who says we are deciding between taking money from a lead investor we don't like and, and waiting for the right investor to come along. Any advice for weighing the pros and cons? So um, you know, I don't, I don't know if you've ever been in this situation, but. You know, there there are times when maybe your favorite investor doesn't like what you're up to, and so they're not interested. Or, um, you know, you come across somebody, yeah. and it's not like the the greatest person in the world. Who, you know, maybe maybe that's the only offer you're going to get. So, what would yeah. you what would you counsel Tommy in thinking about here? Yeah, I think it's pretty easy. I'd say don't do it. Really? Don't take the money. I mean, life's too short. You're so, not, especially if you're 
I mean, the, the, the negative impact of an investor, but I don't know what you don't like about this investor, Tommy, but the negative impact of an investor uh, that's unhappy or that you don't like uh, is, is, is potentially so negative, why would you take that risk? I mean, uh, yeah, I, I'd say hang in there. You know, and it's, the, the other thing is if you've got somebody that you uh, don't feel good about offering you money, you know, uh, that probably means that you're doing something right. And there's probably somebody else willing to give you money. So without knowing anything else, I'd say absolutely don't do it. Hang in there. Uh, use use the fact that that person is interested as a uh, as a way of uh, getting more interest from others, and uh, do it that way. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I think it's similar to um, hiring an employee who maybe you know y you're not totally excited about. Like maybe right. they're three quarters of the way there, yep. and um, uh, you yeah. know you, you're you're feeling the pressure because. You've got miles to feed, or you've yeah. got, you know, in the case of hiring, you know, you've got a project that needs some help. But um, I think you end up spending so much time fixing yeah. the problems that uh, it's not worth it. So I agree. I totally agree, especially on the um, the funding part. If you get a bad investor involved in your company, I mean, it yeah it terrible. can it can ruin your company. You so, send a call uh, you every day. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You definitely don't want that. So. Um, uh, good luck. Uh, good luck with that, Tommy. I, uh, I feel for you, but um, hang in there and uh, see if you can leverage that into, into somebody else uh, coming after you. Um, all right, so we've got one here from Derek in New York City. Um, we have an employee who is not working out. He's a nice guy, and we've tried to provide feedback, but it's not working. Any advice for the best way to fire him? So. Um, this is almost the inverse of the previous question, but uh, what, what do you think? I mean, I'm sure you've had to let go of many people yeah, in sure. uh, all sorts of different circumstances. So how, how do you like to handle those situations? Well, I mean, all I'd say is today would be my advice. I mean, you know, I mean, if you're sure that relationship's not working, then end it now. It's a benefit to him to, to let him move on and, and to you and then, and then just be uh, direct and immediate about it. And, um, I think we tend to internalize, you know, the, the the emotional tone of it too much because we see companies as correctly. I mean, com companies are like families, but there are many families out there that you can be part of, and a lot of times the fit's just not right. I mean, there are people. I, I I've worked with people that you know that had a terrible experience with their former employer, even to the extent that you'd be like, "Gosh, should I really hire this person?" But they come into my company, a totally different experience, and they have a great time, and they're totally productive. So the, the guy that you're having so much trouble with, right, don't imagine that, like, this is it, and, you know, it's, it's arduous, and what are you going to do, and it, he's never going to be able to work again. That, that's probably not true. He's, he, if you have a quick, you know, hey, this just isn't working out, I, we, we got to stop conversation. Maybe the guy goes out tomorrow and finds a great job, and everybody's happy. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think... Um, what I've found in many of these cases, they, they know it's not working, yeah, right? And totally. it, they've either gotten enough uh, feedback like, hey, you need to fix this or whatever. And I, I always try to not make it personal. Like um, it, it, sometimes it's just chemistry, right? Like the chemistry isn't right. That doesn't mean you can't plug in some other organization, as you said. Yeah. So, um, um, but I, I think the speed is really critical, right? Like usually the whole team knows and and there, you're like way behind on actually pulling the trigger because you know you don't want to be the bad guy or whatever. I, I always I always think of that famous line. I don't know who said it, but I heard it from some great mentor or something, which was, "How many times have you ever encountered friends who are entrepreneurs, CEOs, or whatever, that tell you?" I, I always say to people, "How many times have you fired somebody where later on you said, man, you know, we should have waited longer because I think that would all come together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Zero. Never, uh, one. Uh, not, not that you want to go around willy-nilly, of course, but, uh, but yeah, I think, uh, I think everybody um, does better. So, um, all right, here's, um, here's an anonymous one. Uh, how big should our board of directors be? So, you know, when you're starting out early, yeah. Do you even have a board? None. You know. Yeah, none. That's a new best practice. Really? None. I mean, people are doing that. If you've got a good project, if you got a good good team, people with a bit of background um, have done this before, and you're working on a, again a kind of a design forward, you know, what's you know, let's try something sort of project. None is the right answer at the outset. When you get big enough, uh, you know, take take a good bit more investment. Sure, build a board, keep it small. I don't. Yeah, I, I think having one or two, I, I think having a couple of great board members, having a balance of perspective on the board is more important than anything else. Having lots of people on the board, no, don't do it, few as possible. Yep, totally agree. And, and you know, I, 
I, I heard, um, I met a company recently and um, they'd raised like very little money, like, you know, 200K or something. And one of the investors who was putting in a very small amount of money, like 20K, wanted a board seat. And unfortunately, I met this entrepreneur after he had agreed to give this person a board seat. And I, I knew who it was and mm-hmm. I thought that was a big mistake. And I just said, you know, can you go back to him and, and like say, you know, that's not a good idea for us and he he really he really didn't want to so i ended up passing on the investment just i'm I'm like that's just not a good like like number one the fact that he asked you for that is is just a bad sign overall and um and you know i know i know when you're starting out and you're like getting going you want to you want to please people and you want to get investors in so maybe you give away more than if you've done multiple companies over 20 years right but uh yeah early small investor asking for a board seat would be a Red flag. Don't take the money. <laughs> do not. Don't, don't do it. Exactly. Don't do it. Um, I, I, well, I think it speaks to how do you, as a board member, influence the direction of a company, right? And um, if you're good, if you're Mitch Kapoor, right, mm-hmm. y- you don't need a board seat, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like you, Philip's going to call me if he needs me for something, and I'll be more than happy to help him out. Yeah. And and I'll give him my honest opinion, and he may or may not agree with it, but that's. You know, I, I don't need to be like in charge or you know in control or something. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, uh, def- definitely don't do that. Um, uh, all right, let's see. Here's one from Maya in San Mateo. Um, what are your thoughts on employee compensation? Uh, well, we talked a little bit about this. Um, yeah. Do you do anything out of the ordinary for your teams? And we talked a little bit about that as well. So um, <laughs> we do. Uh, so we should. So, so like. You know, at this stage with high fidelity, um, are you are you trying to do like market rate salaries yeah, and market rate right. stock, or are you doing you know low on one, high on the other, or high on both, or what? What are you trying to do? Our our thinking, and I think this is best. Well, I don't know if this could be said to be a best practice, but it's certainly over time the one that I've come to believe in is um, market market salaries um, within reason. I mean, when things get crazy and you have like a particular skill set in a totally crazy economy like right now where the the price the value of that position gets driven up to like 2x you know as a salary what it was yeah. don't do that i mean do do what is a reasonable fair pay for what that role is uh, and then give people a certain amount of latitude to trade off stock and equity if they want to but i like to try to i think it makes sense to try to make sure everybody's getting enough money that they can eat and that, that they feel well compensated for their livelihood um uh, I think I think that works better in terms of getting people, you know, excited about their work and working hard. Um, I think I think the sort of you know, uh, you know, we're founders, we got a ton of stock, and so we're going to take like little, you know, fractional salaries and stuff. That just makes people angry, uh, you know, and makes them uh, maybe feel sort of entitled in a way that's not healthy when you get into conflict. So I feel it's better to just pay people what what the market is paying, mostly. Yeah. No, that's that's great. I I mean, sometimes it's hard when you haven't raised any money. Um, sure. You know, what what are you going to do then? But uh, uh, and and uh, you know, much like your question about um, when you walk into the house, what do you see? Um, mm-hmm. uh, how people think about their compensation also says a lot about their mercenary qualities or what what they're really after, right? So yeah. uh, so I I tend to. Um, Tend to leave that pretty open-ended and just sort of see what they start talking about. Like mm-hmm. if if, um, uh, if it's all about the paycheck and um, they're not really interested in the equity. Because I had one guy tell me, well, the three companies before me failed or b- before that I joined failed, so the stock's probably not going to be worth anything. Mm-hmm. Um, that's probably a bad sign, right? That yeah, that exactly. person is not bought into your vision and what you're trying to do. So. Um, uh, yeah, but worry. anyway, I hope um, I hope those are some uh, some thoughts on uh, employee comp, and I, re- I really like that idea. I I don't know how you implement that stock thing, but I, I guess it's just you Easy. know. I yeah? mean, the, the implementation of it is literally just an email. I mean, the funny thing is, it's so simple. Uh, the, the actual implementation from a paperwork perspective is simply that those are paid in full options. We do it quarterly, so those options are essentially. Uh, compensation, or you know, their bonus compensation for the last uh, uh, quarter oh, that you were it. there. Got so it. we actually just uh, write them up as new stock option grants that are fully vested at the time that we do that exercise. Oh, cool! So, it's so cool. those are not those are not forward vesting; those are nope. already vested. Already vested, yeah. And then and then we give employees forward vesting stock in the in the manner that all companies do when they come in. But this is a big 
we do this with a lot of our stock. I mean, I could see doing it with all the stock in the long term, but I think it's, you know, it's a big change for people to swallow, and I wouldn't want people to not come to work for high fidelity just because they were terrified, you know, you're going to do all this on a quarterly basis or whatever. But yeah. it's, it's the right idea. Yeah. It's super no, motivating. It's, it's very cool. I, you, you know, is that well publicized that you're doing that? A little uh, bit. We've talked about it a little bit, and uh, some, I, uh, some other uh, c uh, companies and uh, folks we know uh, have, have, have are trying it and doing it. You should do um, like a, a, I don't know, a blog post or I don't know where you publish your stuff yeah. or, uh, uh, but, but I mean, that, that's like a pretty cool idea. I know um, Airbnb was doing some creative yeah. um, compensation stuff and they, I mean, they got a ton of press about like, Hey, they're taking a different mm -hmm. approach to compensating employees. It's so, a good uh, point. I think we have a blog up on our on, on High Fidelity about it, um, but I think it's on the High Fidelity side and not on the my personal side. But oh. we've we've talked about it a little bit. But All yeah, right. we probably need to do it as, well, again, we'll, as we get we'll, bigger. If so people we'll, believe we're still doing it as a bigger company, <laughs> it's great. We'll understand. try and find it and uh, and tweet mm -hmm. it out as well. Sure. So. Um, all right, well, I think, I think we have um, time for one more, and this one is from Miguel. Uh, it is, how do I find a co-founder? So this is a great question. Um, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe talk about your experiences. Have you always had co-founders, or did you do, I mean, I, I think Linden Lab, did you start by yourself and pull have, some people in? I have two amazing co-founders at High Fidelity. Uh, they are friends. Um, one that I worked with for a decade already, and another that I uh, have had known have known for like two decades. So, um, in that case, it was a little different. Um, we just shared a common passion for wanting to work on stuff together. We actually worked on Coffee Power together. Um, finding a co-founder, though, you know this con this concept of sort of dating, and you know how do you how do you find your co-founders? It's an interesting one. You know, uh, uh, I'm an advisor to a, a, a company called Founder Dating that that focuses just on this problem. And there's a lot of you know I think there's a lot of interesting and in Coffee and Power we're working on this a little bit. You know, how do you get people to find each other as they pass by in coffee shops. We loved, we thought it was very romantic, this idea that as you just wandered around San Francisco, given that there were so many of us, you know, wandering around, you'd somehow sort of serendipitously run into each other. Um, I think it's a hard problem. I, I, I'd have to say I'm a little stumped on that one. I mean, I, I maybe it is kind of like dating, right? There aren't any easy answers. Yeah, you know? I mean, well, the, I mean, I think part of what you said is the best way, which is somebody that you've worked with before, and and you just you know each other, you know sort of strengths and weaknesses, and those are great situations. I, I've done both. I've started companies with people I knew, and some with people I didn't know, and. Uh, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag. Like sometimes you don't know what you're gonna get, and uh, in true colors, you, you don't get to see what somebody's really like until the shit hits the fan, right? right, right so, right. Um, and you can't you can't really simulate that up front. Yep. So, um, you know, I think yep. I think reference checking helps a little bit, but uh, you know, the references people give you are usually gonna yeah. say great things about them. So I always try and do like backdoor references, like call somebody I trust who knows them but doesn't know that we're talking to each other. You know, I, I would make one final point about that, though, about finding a co-founder, more on the sort of dating side of, like, finding somebody that really shares common belief and passion about the product. Yeah. One of the things that's making San Francisco take over the world um, and conti continue to take over the world in software is that there is an incredible uh, promiscuity around ideas here. We are willing to share our ideas with each other. You know this feeling. Yeah. Um, and it's more true in San Francisco than it is in New York or Los Angeles or London or anywhere else. I tell you, there's many different ways to study it. It's absolutely true. We don't sign NDAs here. We don't ask for them. We don't, we don't usually sign them. Um, people will talk to you about what they're working on you know, in a heartbeat here in San Francisco. That's exactly what they're doing, even if there's a competitive risk that you'll take their idea and start it yourself. I think that's one of the great ways to get a co-founder, right, is to just be willing to put your cards on the table and be open about what you're doing. Yep. Um, be really open about what you think is going to work, what's not going to work. So that's one thing I would say is if you try to find a co-founder right now, go out there and be passionate and open and communicative about your ideas in any venue you can. You know, go to some of these meetups and, you know, uh, you know find some sites where you can find other, uh, you know, well-matched people to start something with, but then be really honest and don't be afraid of them taking your idea. I think if you've got that confidence and you're willing to share like that, statistically at least, you succeed, which is what we see uh, looking at San Francisco as having happen. Yeah, absolutely, that's great advice. And I, I think it's, um, uh, we get questions sometimes about, well, should I tell, 
tell my investors, you know, up front what I'm doing. And it's like, well, <laughs> they're not gonna they're not gonna respond if you don't. So yeah. you better Good you know grief. get used yeah. to that. And, and I, I think we're so used to it that it's just yeah. second nature at this point. And uh, for other people, factor. it's it's different. So. Um, well, I'm afraid we are out of time, so thanks for doing such a great job today. Uh, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. This has been fun. Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, you can follow uh, Philip on Twitter. His handle is at Philip Rosedale, one L, right? That's right, one L. One L. <laughs> so, uh, so check him out up there. Um, uh, tune in next week for another episode of Founderline. Our guest will be Josh Stein of DFJ. So Josh uh, has funded a bunch of interesting companies, including Box and Chartbeat, TalkDesk, and Yammer, which is uh, which was bought by Microsoft. Uh, it'll be a great show next Wednesday, July 8th at 5 o'clock Pacific time. Um, thanks once again to our fantastic sponsors, Auric, Square One Bank, Accretive Solutions, and Ustream. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Founderline. And if you have uh, questions for Josh, uh, you can send them in advance either via email, uh, help at founderline.com, or to the Twitter handle. Um, you can also check out the website uh, at founderline.com where you can watch previous episodes. You can read about the upcoming guests. Uh, and you can also subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Uh, thanks for watching. Here's to the crazy ones. And we'll see you again next time.